Hello, everybody. I'm John Cadera. I'm an associate member. That's what they call an associate professor at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, I'm one of the PIs for the Open Force Field Initiative, which is the NIH funded part of the effort. And I'm super thrilled to be here because I, like, I can't tell you how spectacularly happy I am that OMSF has really taken off and to see both open free energy and open force field and all of these other things like open fold, nucleating and taking shape and having an opportunity to interact and create a wonderful interoperable ecosystem. Um, so I wanted to start and talk about really two questions uh, for, so this should be a bit more discussion provoking at the end, two questions for this group. Um, one of which is, well, Smirnoff is the world's number one vodka, is it really the world's number one parameter assignment scheme? And I'm gonna at least describe a highly experimental approach that we've taken, funded by the NIH grant uh, for Open Force Field, that you can download and use in a conda package very shortly, um, but is gonna be on the experimental side for a while. And so we think about whether it makes sense in the mainstream, mainline for Open Force Field. And the other one is, are we really missing out on the advantages that machine learning frameworks afford uh, for optimizing force fields? Uh, and we're thinking about force Force balance, the major central part of our infrastructure right now, it's now over 15 years old, something like that, maybe more. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities that I think we can exploit. We'll have a, 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 an illustration of what that affords in the Espeloma toolkit. So as all of you folks know here, the, the Smirnoff specification or Smirks native open force field specification, which is really borrowing uh, the only the tagging from Smirks uh, into Smarts, describes not just a single atom, uh, but a bond or an angle or a torsion or any kind of valence type by assigning uh, a whole smirks string to it where you've tagged the atom that you're interested in or atoms that you're interested in. In this case, it's describing a bond that has a certain chemical environment. It's an industry standard. It's really great. It's allowed huge compression of the chemical perception from atom types. There's many advantages that David Mobley has talked about in the past, but it does present these challenges. And Tobias uh, gave a great talk as well as Trevor uh, about ways in which we can think about this. I'm just going to you know, set the stage by saying it is really difficult to optimize these types because of the fact that they are mixed continuous, right? Continuous discrete. So we've got these discrete types and we have to keep refining them in some way where we think about like how detailed should we get before we uh, distinguish one type from another type. And trying to do this continuous and discrete optimization at the same time, especially starting from scratch, is just really difficult. Josh Fast and my group spent some time on this with a versatile jump. Tobias has really made a way to find a way to make this work uh, very well, uh, but it's it's difficult to get a good converged equilibrium sample from this joint space. It's just a really difficult problem, mixed discrete continuous optimization. So Yuan Ching Wang and the group, along with Josh Fast, had decided that maybe you know, everything else is continuously optimizable. Is there some way to make the typing continuously optimizable as well? And so uh, thought about what if we had a embeddable um, way of saying how different every part of the molecule was from other similar parts in other molecules. Mm -hmm. And so they came up with this graph convolutional net. Uh, I apologize that Yuanqing wasn't able to give his talk remotely <clears throat> uh, today or to be here. Uh, the U.S. Embassy uh, wouldn't let him back in the country um, right away, so uh, thankfully they've now uh, allowed him to come back and assume his fellow position at NYU, where he's also a Schmidt Fellow, um, starting his independent career. Um, but he and Josh came up with this really fantastic idea that we can take a, a chemical graph that represents a small molecule or a big molecule or you know, a protein conjugated to a small molecule, for example, and then using message passing graph neural networks to come up with the vector that represents every atom. And what's interesting about this is that uh, we uh, have to be very gingerly careful with the uh, HDMI cable. But uh, what's interesting about this is that um, you automatically get chemical equivalences because of the equivariance nature of this graph. So that means that if you have methyl protons, they're automatically assigned the same vectorial representation of what their chemical environment is. And if you have uh, nitrogens that are in slightly different environments because they're in slightly different regions uh, that have different things bonded near them, they'll get different types. And so we, we solve this problem of having discrete uh, typing. Um, next is uh, you can then propagate to uh, bonds, add angles, and torsions, realizing that a torsion fed in IJKL is the same as LKJI, right? They have to get the same type. So we use this symmetry-based pooling to make sure we get a vector that uniquely describes each bond, each angle, each torsion, each atom. And then you could feed these into just a feed forward neural network that ends up emitting the parameters that you need for your force field. And by doing that, you make a very modular approach 
that is also fully end-to-end -end differentiable. So if we wanted to add polar point polarizability, if we wanted to add special one four parameters, we just take the appropriate type coming in from the stage two, and then we add on a neural network module to predict what the parameters are for that new type. And then we just refit the model. And it's fully end-to-end -end differentiable. So it learns both the typing, the type assignment in stage one, and the parameter prediction and interpolation in the final stage. And you can link it up to whatever likelihood functions you might want. So right now in, in the open force field force balance, we use both quantum chemical targets, which are various things that look at the loss or deviation from a quantum chemical property, like energies for confirmation, as well as physical properties like uh, you know equilibrium densities or dielectric constants or possibly even free energies. So we're focusing now just as this proof of concept on uh, quantum chemical conformations and energies, but I'll show you uh, just a, as an example, right? This can actually recapitulate what we think about as typing. So if we think about just the first stage and I'll take these embeddings and then cluster them into, or put them into a bin and just assign, can I learn a GAF atom type, right? There's a bunch of GAF atom types. There's a lot of them. In fact, there's a lot of carbons in particular, and it does misassign some of these, but they're misassigning in a way that I would have trouble assigning uh, the specific gap atom types if you gave me the description. So in this case, it's sometimes confusing NF with NC, uh, which is a inner sp2 nitrogen in a conjugated system identical to NE, but in a not in a non-pure aromatic system. So I, I I wouldn't know exactly which one to assign in this case. There's a few other cases that that are like this as well, where the confusions mimic perhaps the uh, the the lack of crispness in the definition of chemical environments in these. So it makes human-like confusion in those. But rest assured, if you give it GAF energies or open force field energies, it can actually learn them quite well. So now I'm showing it confirmations and asking it to learn the energies. And in fact, it recapitulates the bonds, angles, torsions, et cetera, very well from just showing it a force field. So this is also, uh, in a way, something that could help us take legacy force fields, like a charm small molecule force field, for example, for which there's not a good free parameterization engine, and learn how to apply charm-like parameters if we wanted to. But what's really exciting is just showing it quantum chemical directly, like we do with force balance, and then having it learn the force field directly. And I'm just going to walk you through a few experiments we did to try to understand how it works and what how it fails. So uh, Falcatho is this wonderful set that uh, Christopher Bailey put forward uh, because it's very exhaustively exploring the kinds of environments you might find uh, if you've if you've uh, enumerated pretty much all of the possible environments for a simple non-complex carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen system. So it has phenyls, alkanes, ethers, and alcohols. Um, it's really a low complexity chemical space. And what's nice here is that, so we've broken out, we have a training set, we have a test set from this space, and we're reporting here, uh, all of these are test molecules on these other force fields. So it seems to do in terms of RMS error for these different confirmations, um, uh, error to quantum chemistry, reasonably well in terms of kcals per mole. Uh, in fact, it does a little bit better than open force field does in this pretty uncomplex case. These are 95% confidence intervals on the upper right and lower, upper, upper, lower left. Lower right and upper right. Um, now, if we show it the training set for open force field 1.2, what's surprising is that it does much better on, on the test set here than it does on the on, open force field does on the training set. So it, it's a diverse set of molecules, but maybe this is suggesting that somehow by allowing us continuous interpolation between different uh, specific types, rather than being pinned to specific Smirnoff types, we're actually able to increase the accuracy over what open force field did on its own training set. This is something that we've been trying for a while with these Weiberg bond order based interpolations. There's good physical reasons why that should happen. And maybe this is allowing us to implicitly learn some of that and, and how to actually deploy it. Uh, we were also suggested by Katarina Meyer, um, the vehicle data set, which is this really exhaustive exploration of bicycle, bicyclic uh, scaffold, heterocyclic scaffolds of the future, uh, which could be important for future compounds that might be uh, give us slightly different bond vectors and slightly different polarities inside of binding sites. Some of these look a little crazy, obviously, with the number of nitrogens you find in them. I wouldn't want to be caught dead anywhere near them because I might end up dead. Um, but uh, what was surprising is how much better Espeloma did in this case than the open force field. Uh, and in fact, all the other models. The reason actually turns out to be quite simple. So these were all subjected to Q, uh, QC fractal quantum chemical minimizations. Um, and it turns out that some of these were not aromatic at all. There was a cheminformatics error in their preparation where they simply didn't satisfy uh, aromaticity. And uh, the quantum chemistry picked up on this and correctly made these weird nitrogen-containing compounds appropriately pyramidal. 
Um, again, I, I don't know how realistic it would be for a synthetic chemist to access these scaffolds, but the fact that just by having a couple of examples sneak into the training set, Espeloma was able to pick, on, pick up on the fact that these should be different types and then assign them different types was actually really heartening. That suggests to us that um, it's really able, it gives us a new paradigm for solving the problem by just coming up with more examples rather than having to have someone like Christopher help nominate new types. We can also show it peptides, and it seems to do better than Amber 14 SB does, which is terrifying, uh, because a lot of time and effort has gone into uh, parameterizing Amber over the years and fixing a number of issues. We can, in fact, show it both peptides and small molecules and come up with a joint small molecule peptide force field. So this is the first uh, combined uh, force field uh, that I, I think the, the effort pr produced until Chapin's uh, new version comes out of uh, a self-consistent uh, treatment, but it, it does seem to show stable simulations, which is really uh, impressive for something that is still using Leonard Jones and AM1BCC from open force field 1.2 in this case, uh, but then just retyping all of the valence terms. Now, of course, there's not a big opportunity for it to go off the rails, right? It's just learning the valence types in this case. But what's really cool about this is that it does display the self-consistent size properties that you might expect. There's a certain limit to the number of rounds of message passing that you take. So you can't have effects that from the ends extend far too far. So if you're looking at inserting different numbers of alanines inside of a capped alanine peptide, all of the on lengths and all the charges, for example, as we plot here, all seem to stabilize after a very short uh, edge effect uh, imposition, which may be realistic, right? And then uh, seem to be pretty stable so that you can, you know, you can actually type full biopolymers. It's actually very fast. There's some catastrophe here on the right side, but you'll see that uh, everything takes less than a second, even up to 500 residues, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and that's just on a CPU. In fact, you can uh, takes much less than that on a GPU. So you can actually use a GPU to assign parameters, perhaps for many things at once, because you can bundle all of the graphs into a single large graph that doesn't have connections in it. So if you need to parameterize many molecules. Um, the really cool thing I thought was that covalent ligands are now a breeze, right? If I have a brutinib in its pre-reacted uh, form, this is a covalent kinase inhibitor of BTK. Um, it has this um, warhead over here that changes when it actually binds to the cysteine. Here's the peptide part of uh, BTK that gets changed by uh, or labeled by this brutinib. And you can see that if you, it's hard to see with the, the small uh, numbers here, but uh, you can take my word for it that there's some rearrangement in charges and, and bonds right around the reactive group, but the rest of the molecule remains unperturbed. So it doesn't do catastrophic things to your molecule. And in fact, this will um, uh, we can also self-consistently assign charges using the same kind of approach that Lily spoke about, I think, uh, today, this morning, yesterday. Sorry, we'll speak about it. Did or will, yes, um, in the keynote. Um, so what's cool here is that, okay, if we use the, this to apply small molecule parameters because we are now only, only now thanks to the biopolymer support uh, for PDV reading uh, from open force field able to get the proteins in for our, into our tool chain for free energy calculations. If you just replace the small molecule parameters, it seems to do reasonably well. Um, it's very competitive with open force field 2.0, maybe slightly better, but it's hard to say. Um, certainly we need to try more systems to be able to say with certainty or confidence that it does, does any better than open force field 2.0, 2.1. Um, but the other cool thing is you can also propagate, just like we see with other, uh, uh, we saw with host guest systems, you can also propagate free energy. So anything you can compute and differentiate, you can also include as a target. Uh, and in fact, the differentiation is automatic since we're using a machine learning framework. I'll get to that more in, in just a moment. Um, I've mentioned the, uh, there's some, there's, there, there are potential advantages to using both the conformer energies and partial charges or potential ESPs. Um, in training a joint model, because it seems that there's information content about learning about differences in, in atom uh, chemical environments by training everything together. So you do see a reduction in error if you train on both uh, the energetics and the charges at the same time. So that's another important thing to keep in mind. I've already shown you stable simulations. So the next thing was, this was a very small training set. Admittedly, we were limited in the size of the training set data initially for uh, partially because of the lack of scalability of force balance, getting it to feed it many more quantum chemical data uh, measurements. Um, also, we just didn't have a lot of data in QC fractal at the time that was appropriate. Uh, so as part of a collaboration between Open Force Field and, uh, Open, um, and OpenMM, I, apologies, I don't have all of the names here, but you should go read the paper 
or check out the data set uh, for all of the folks that contributed. It was a really a team effort, um, generated a very large uh, multi-million snapshot data set that has very good elemental coverage um, that provides us with information about the chemistry, the chem, chem compounds that, that we have, including their bonds uh, that went into this. So we can parameterize from that information. Any doesn't have any bond information, which makes it a, a very difficult set to use. Plus it's also very limited in, in elements. This set was generated with both a very high level of theory and a lower level of theory or the lower level of theory that open force field uses as its default specification. So it can be mixed and matched. This was generated slightly differently from what we've done with open force field in the past, because unlike the optimization data sets, which are trajectories of optimization or the um, uh, torsion data sets. And I should say that all of the data I've just shown you is just using optimization data sets. We didn't even use any torsions. So we seem to be able to recapitulate torsions reasonably well. Um, if we do use that torsion data, that's that's great too. We use every point along the minimization trajectory, however, for the optimization data set. But these are generated with MD simulations using, I think, either GAF or open force field, I can't recall which, um, and then using off equilibrium snapshots at slightly elevated temperature to get a better representation of what the energy surface might look like. Now, Ken Takaba and the group has been working on extending this to nucleic acids as well. He's particularly interested in RNA. You might not have noticed that there's a huge number of companies that are interested in drugging RNA with small molecules or otherwise using them as a platform. I had some RNA injected into my arm, maybe you did too. Uh, so it's suddenly become very important. Um, Ken has worked with uh, folks in the open force field side like uh, Pavan and Trevor and um, uh, David Donson uh, to help generate uh, a large RNA data set that supplements the SPICE data. We can do the same with DNA at some point as well. And he's been collaborating with Yuan Ching on training on this updated data set that includes a subset of SPICE uh, that is all of the open force field generation two optimization data, um, some SPICE pubchem molecules, which include a lot of different kinds of, of chemistries, uh, both the dipeptides and monomers uh, from the DESRES set and uh, the also the uh, dipeptide, uh, a dipeptide representative MD set, as well as the RNA data. And what's really interesting is that it seems, it's very hard to see these numbers, but it seems to beat all existing force fields, at least in this energy metric. So it's test, so it's, we hold out some of the data from each of these sets to leave as test set data, hold out some of the molecules, and then we use that to estimate the test data set, which is also estimated for all of these other force fields. So even for RNA force fields, RNA OL3 for member, it seems to do very well for energetic properties. Uh, they're calling it spicy espeloma for this, uh, but it'll be espeloma 0.3.0 or 0.4.0, depending upon where they settle. There's already a pre-release available. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, thanks to um, uh, David Mobley, uh, helping us work with Pavan, uh, we've gone through a several iterations of benchmarking and identifying limitations and failures and improving things like how we treat the improper torsions. It turns out we were trying to predict too many improper torsions, and there are still many things that can be refined with this perception approach about how we uh, assign uh, torsions because we we let it assign any sign to the Ks, uh, so you can get the phase um, as a continuous parameter. Uh, from one n equals one all the way through n equals six periodicity to torsion. So we've had to trim that a little to do what open force field does to limit it to one or n equals one or n equals two for improper. But it does seem that the qu these quality metrics are suggesting that it's doing very well on this industry uh, nominated benchmark set. Um, it also seems to be doing reasonably well on free energy calculations. Again, rivaling uh, the open force field 2.0 in accuracy. We'll have to see how that works, how that plays out for many more, uh, many more sets. Okay, so that's the first question or proposal uh, is that I think this might be a competitive way of solving these challenges in mixed continuous discrete optimization. Uh, and that's something that, that we could we can investigate as a potentially forward in parallel to Smirnoff for a while, but possibly uh, to replace it sometime in the future. The other thing is I wanted to uh, in, engage with you about how useful it has been to use these machine learning frameworks. There's a lot of effort behind these, a lot of folks are using them. This is now a very old example, but it shows you just how exciting it is to have, you know, somebody has curated uh, a standardized data set like the open force field has, and you can access that programmatically in one line. Um, you have a novel uh, architecture that you can define, which might be a completely new type of architecture using powerful abstractions that thanks to the toolkit writers, you can compose very easily. And then using best practices, standard best practices, you can optimize it, assess how well it's doing, and then actually use it. Just in a few lines of code, 
And we could do similar things with force fields if we re really wanted to. This is not a working example, but it's certainly the inspiration for what we'd like to do. What if I just comment out the bond charge corrections or add in a point polarizability or add in a special one four exception and then refit and then do these experiments very easily. This is a working example of that realization. This is fitting an entire force field in S. Paloma. It's very easy. It's also very easy to extend because I just need to add a few more lines to express whatever energy functions I want to implement. It makes force field science very easy in terms of exploring different models. At least if you're doing fitting to quantum chemistry, it takes more effort, of course, to fit to experimental data. Now, these machine learning frameworks are great because first of all, another major, major companies are pouring money into maintaining them so we don't have to. That relieves us of some infrastructure burden, right? We have to maintain, mm -hmm. along with the uh, Li Ping Wang group, uh, force balance at the moment. The other thing is hardware acceleration is baked into these machine learning, fr learning frameworks and they're always investing in making them faster. We could build force fields on GPUs as a result. They're scalable. These, force field, these frameworks have scaled some of the largest hardware installations available, probably much larger than we have access to. There's a lot of libraries of optimizers or Bayesian samplers or tools for tracking the experiments that you run, like weights and biases. Um, there's also a lot of support. There's many people using this compared to the number of people using force balance. So there are two experimental versions of Espaloma available right now. Um, they're almost Conda installable. Uh, right now we're working on one of the tool chain issues I'll get to in just a moment. Um, one is a PyTorch based version and the other is a JAX based version. The PyTorch one is much more mature. The JAX is even more ex doubly experimental, but they fundamentally do the same thing. JAX is an exciting approach because I think many of you know PyTorch, but JAX is combining Python with Autograd and then the Google-based backend that TensorFlow uses called XLA, which translates code that's been compiled just in time to run very fast on hardware. So it'll run fast on a GPU or a TPU or a CPU or any new hardware that comes along that you might want to actually take advantage of. Somebody else is going to take advantage, is going to figure out how to do that quickly. And it just is Python with four superpowers. One of them is JIT, which is make it fast. You can wrap any function in that. Rad, which is give me the gradient with respect to parameters or whatever. Vmap, which is do it in parallel on the GPU or TPU. And then Pmap is do it in parallel across many nodes. And you can combine them in any way you want. And it's been the ML choice of DeepMind for a long time and likely will replace TensorFlow at Google if, if things keep going the way they're going. So if we think about what impact this would have for our communities, right? The scientists might be able to rapidly carry out faster refitting experiments if they could fit with the GPU. Uh, they can more easily explore new potential terms because it's much easier to code one of those up than a whole plugin that takes advantage of something in OpenMM. They can experiment with these potential with ML potentials as well because they're all written for these frameworks and not for OpenMM. Um, can simultaneously build and assess both Smirnoff and Espaloma style force fields would be the dream. So you can optimize parameters with fixed Espaloma types, or you could um, uh, fixed Smirnoff types, or you could optimize an entire Espaloma set. Or you could even build these Bayesian ensembles and explore Bayesian force field parameters of uh, families. For the engineers who have to do this for big fits, it would be fast and scalable and reproducible. Uh, and for industry, I'd like to think about this paradigm. You know, could we make it easy enough for people to use in industry that we are producing the foundation models that people take home and tailor to the data sets and problems they have internally? This could be a new paradigm for industry to, to really rapidly fine-tune and get better results out of our force fields for the problems that they care about. And we haven't focused on making it easy to use for industry yet. It's possible. But if we were able to do that, it would be much easier with these uh, deployable machine learning frameworks. And there's a few opportunities as well about how we could, how, how we could overcome uh, some issues to make this better. One of which is that we can use our existing tools like the property calculator that Simon and others have engineered for computing free energies and gradients. A lot of it is setting up workflows to uh, build these systems and simulate them in a way that is uh, automatable. Um, but at some point we can integrate these ML implementations of the energy functions to evaluate the gradients much more efficiently. Um, we could also potentially ultimately replace the OpenMM layer with a ML-based simulation engine if one comes along. There's a few experimental ones like um, uh, TorchMD uh, and a few others at the moment, but uh, this might be something that is also an opportunity in the future to let us take better advantage of these big GPUs, which waste a lot of time by simulating a very tiny system. We can pack them all together. Uh, David Cerruti, of course, has a, another way to do that, but uh, this would be one, one possible alternative. And of course, condom packaging is a challenge because this community has standardized on PIP. Now, 
that's a discussion that we can have that's much larger, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity for us to help work with these communities uh, and get all of their tools uh, onto Conda as well. Um, we've managed to do this for everything except DGL, which is the final piece because it has lots of dependencies that have been pulled in. Um, so we're almost there and Mike, uh, Mike Henry has been uh, really pushing this forward. So we're almost to the point where you can install it by Conda. You can very easily install it other ways though. And so for if, if there's any time left, uh, I'd also be interested in what folks think about, um, you know, we do have some opportunities and we have to figure some things out. One of them is this benchmarking suite that was announced yesterday is going to be really exciting. It has these modules that allow us to plug in different uh, ways to compute data and compare against it. The same modules are used here to parameterize and we, we want to compute gradients of them. So there's an opportunity to avoid duplicating our work by architecting these properly so that they can go into either framework perhaps. We also want to think about what is the MVP? What minimum functionality would we need in order to be able to swap out force balance, at least for some tasks? Would it be interesting first to try the industry tailoring, for example, where you they can easily generate quantum chemical data or any like data that they can use to tailor their uh, quantum chemical, the quantum, to generate quantum chemical data sets to tailor just the balance, but stick to our uh, non-bonded, for example, that could be an easy win. Would it be really useful to do balance fitting uh, to quantum chemistry for the scientists for force field, open force field to be able to try out new functional forms very easily? We have to think about what that M MVP is. And then is there a path to deprecating force balance? Is it something that we want to keep alive all the time? We don't want to have to support two different routes to do something forever, but there might be some sort of sensible route to thinking about sunsetting it in the future. And with that, I'd like to Thank all of you for your attention. And if you had any thoughts on the discussion questions, I'd welcome them during the questions.